Hello, everyone. Today, we are back with my commentary of sorts on Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologia. We are looking at the question, the nature and extent of sacred doctrine, Article 2, whether sacred doctrine is a science. So I'm going to start off by reading the, um, the entire thing, and then I will go back through it to explain um, everything, my thoughts, um, where I think Aquinas is right, perhaps areas where I disagree, and where the Lutherans have gone historically. So this is Article 2, whether sacred doctrine is a science. Objection one, it seems that sacred doctrine is not a science. For every science proceeds from self-evident principles, but sacred doctrine proceeds from articles of faith which are not self-evident, since their truth is not admitted by all, for all men have not faith. Second Thessalonians 3, 2. Therefore, sacred doctrine is not a science. Objection two, further, no science deals with individual facts. But this sacred science treats of individual facts, such as the deeds of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but such like. Therefore, sacred doctrine is not a science. On the contrary, Augustine says in De Trinitate, uh, Book 14, Chapter 1, to this science alone belongs that whereby saving faith is begotten, nourished, protected, and strengthened. But this can be said of no science except sacred doctrine. Therefore, sacred doctrine is a science. I answer that. Sacred doctrine is a science. We must bear in mind that there are two kinds of sciences. There are some which proceed from a principle known by the natural light of intelligence, such as arithmetic and geometry and the like. There are some which proceed from principles known by the light of a higher science. Thus, the science of perspective proceeds from principles established by geometry and music from principles established by arithmetic. So it is that sacred doctrine is a science because it proceeds from principles established by the light of a higher science, namely the science of God and the blessed. Hence, just as the musician accepts on authority the principles taught him by the mathematician, so sacred science is established on principles revealed by God. Reply to objection one. The principles of any science are either in themselves self-evident or reducible to the conclusions of a higher science, and such, as we have said, are the principles of sacred doctrine. Reply to objection two. Individual facts are treated of in sacred science, not or sacred doctrine, not because it is concerned with them princip principally, but they are introduced rather both as examples to be followed in our lives as in moral sciences and in order to establish the authority of those men through whom the divine revelation on which the sacred scripture or doctrine is based has come down to us. Okay, so now let's go through this whole thing. So the status of the controversy is basically... Well, how do we define theology in terms of the academic disciplines? When asking if faith is a science, he's not asking if articles of faith are empirically studied like in modern sciences, but if theology fits into what Aristotle and the Aristotelians would call a science. Um, so a fair amount of this video will actually basically just be about the definition of science because it's a good practice to know our terms well. And many do not know how this term is used in scholastic theologians and philosophers. Aristotle says that we uncover scientific knowledge through logical syllogism, where the conclusion follows necessarily from the truth of the premises. Recall that a syllogism is basic in logic. You have a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. The major premise is a broad statement. The minor premise is a statement that scales down the major premise into something more familiar and concrete, and the conclusion logically follows from the premises. The classic example, of course, is going to be major premise, all men are mortal, minor premise, Socrates is a man. Conclusion, therefore, Socrates is mortal. For scientific knowledge, according to Aristotle, we use syllogistic reasoning. It's not merely having a sound syllogistic argument that, that constitutes scientific knowledge. Aristotle adds that we must understand the causal principles involved. So not only the efficient cause um, and say the material cause, but also the formal and final causes. So all of the four causes. Recall that when we read or when you hear the term cause in terms of Aristotle, a good way to think of it is it's not merely a cause in the modern sense. Think of it like when you're explaining the thing, you're saying it is this way because, think of it that way. That's something I saw from um, a translator on a scholastic treatise. So that was really helpful. Anyway, these truths must be universal and necessary. So we don't have scientific knowledge about individuals as individuals. This passage from Aristotle summarizes his position fairly well. This is from his Posterior Analytics, Book 1, Part 2. 
quote, we suppose ourselves to possess unqualified scientific knowledge of a thing as opposed to knowing it in an accidental way in which the sophist knows. When we think that we know the cause on which the fact depends as the cause of that fact and no other, and further that the fact could not be other than it is, unquote. Now Aquinas sees science in a very similar way to Aristotle. Because Aquinas is a Christian theologian, he will see science as extending the theological matters, um, as we see in this portion. I'm not saying all Christians affirm that, as we'll see, but simply put, Aquinas would say, well, it can extend to theologic, theological things, so he does. He says it does. Other theologians will say, well, in you know, it's possible theoretically, um, since theology is its own thing with divine revelation. We have to consider it in a different way than, say, Plato would consider um, theology as such. Again, we could say that many Christian theologians throughout history, like Scotus, Hallatz, Widener, and Bonaventure, are going to ask a similar question. Now, that said, I, it is an interesting thing to look at Aristotle's definition of science and wonder, well, how can we apply it really to theological studies at all? It's it's tricky because now Ephraim Batoni, who has a, a really good book summarizing Scotus, um, suggests that if we follow Aristotle's definition really strictly, then we can't have scientific knowledge in the way Aristotle requires, at least for some things. Because it appears that we have sciences and aren't about necessary things. So, for example, humanity is not necessary in the sense that humans exist across all possible worlds. Um, again, treating modal language like that as a heuristic device, perhaps. Yet we can say that we have scientific knowledge of humanity. So I, I guess we would have to ask and further study what the concept of necessity is. Is it necessary in the sense that it's speaking of universal truths, like the fact that humans must be rationally human? Or is it more so, more so speaking of a necessity that necessarily occurs or necessarily exists? It's just, it's kind of tricky. And that's going to factor into your understanding of this and, and how qualified you're going to make it. So some would say, okay, well, theology is a science in like a qualified sense. Some are going to say it's just totally unqualified since it meets all the criteria. I'm actually not sure on that. That's something to think about more. I think it's something we should consider. Um, nonetheless, I think we should admit that there has to be some level of necessity. We don't speak of the science of individual things like my dog versus your dog. So I'd say tentatively that we're speaking of necessity in the sense of some kind of universality in the object considered, though that's obviously its own dispute as to what Aristotle means and how we can apply it. So please, uh, I would say tentatively, tentatively take my view that I think it's about a universality thing more so than a matter of like necessary existence. Anyway, let's move on to these objections. So objection one says that sacred doctrine is not a science because every science proceeds from self-evident principles, but sacred doctrine proceeds from principles of faith. This is fairly obvious because, well, science in general should proceed from self-evident principles, but statements from the Bible are not self-evident. When we speak of self-evident principles, it's not that the statements are certain or infallible per se, it's that they're simply true as such. They're, they're necessary. A self-evident truth is one that, well, you don't need an argument to be established. These truths may not be immediately known to everybody, hence the whole issue of certainty and infallibility, um, but they are necessarily true in themselves. The statements of scripture, though, at least some of them are not self-evident. So, uh, for example, the statement that David was the king of Israel is not a self-evident statement. It's true, but it's not something where the subject necess necessitates the predicate or vice versa. Gerhard makes an argument like this and is on the nature of theology and scripture. He argues that the certainty of a fact depends on internal and inherent principles, while the certainty of faith depends on external principles, which are built upon the authority of the one giving those principles. And he concludes explicitly against Thomas that theology is not a science. Um, so, of course, you could say something like, all right, well, obviously, David being the king of Israel, I mean, that's going to be examined in objection two. It's kind of mixing that. We can just expand this out. I mean, there are plenty of articles of faith that are not self-evident propositions to us. Think of, I mean, the Trinity, right? Like, we have to take that by faith. And, and even going beyond the, the question of can it be demonstrated on the basis of, say, fittingness or something like that, I think most are going to admit the unregenerate cannot do such. So it's not self-evident to us. So we have to look at this and say, all right, well, there is some difference between typical sciences and the science that we find, uh, or what we would find in theology, if it were a science, or something distinguishing them in that respect. 
Now, objection two right here says that science does not deal with individual facts, but theology does. So the works of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So theology can't be a science. Per our definition of science from above, science is about universal truth. Gerhard uses a similar argument, saying that the subject of theology is Christ, and we cannot have knowledge of Christ scientifically. Anyway, there are a few more objections that um, Gerhard gives. Even though Aquinas only has two, Gerhard disagreeing with Aquinas is going to add his own that are, I think, fairly similar. Gerhard adds that in theology, we seek understanding as the goal, but in science, understanding is the principle. He actually cites um, Augustine on this, who says, quote, we believe that we may understand. We do not understand that we may believe, end quote. That's uh, from De Trinitate, book 15, chapter 2. Gerhard's additional argument is that, well, something false can underlie science, but a falsehood cannot underlie faith. Um, not the subjective faith, but you know, the faith that's contained in the scriptures. Gerhard concludes ultimately that theology is wisdom, not science. We'll get back to this in a later video because Aquinas asks if uh, theology is wisdom. Now let's look at Aquinas' um, his on the contrary, and I answer that, as well as his objections. So of course Aquinas says, as we read, that theology is a science, and then he clarifies the definition of a science. He says that there are two kinds of sciences, those that proceed from principles according to the natural light of reason and those proceeding from principles known by a higher science. Theology is in the latter, and the sacred science is a science that God has of himself as well as the science that the blessed have in beatitude. So what that's saying is, well, God has scientific knowledge of himself, and there is some distinction that you'll see in theologians that there are there's the knowledge God has of himself, which is like, I mean, obviously fully scientific, um, archetypal. Then there's the theology of those in eternity, the blessed, specifically the beatified. That's obviously not quite God's knowledge of himself, but nonetheless much greater than humans on this earth who are not immediately beholding God and are still, you know, struggling with, with sins. We're still, uh, we still have our mortal bodies and so on. And then, of course, there's the um, knowledge that we have of God, uh, those of us who are in this life. So that's what some theologians like uh, Scotus and Bonaventure and uh, Halatz will call the theology of the wayfarer. So that's a, a fairly interesting distinction that I think is helpful. Anyway, Antonius Andreas, who is a Scotus commentator, suggests that there are four conditions for a science as strictly defined. I think this is a, a fairly accurate representation of Aristotle in this thought. First, that is a certain or true knowledge. So it's not just mere conjecture. Second, that it's about a necessary object. We covered that. And <clears throat> again, the question is, well, what does necessity mean? Third, that the object is evident or gives evidence to the intellect. And fourth, that it is caused by premises leading to a conclusion. He correctly says... This is really interesting. This goes back to our, our discussion of the theology of the wayfarer versus the theology of the blessed and uh, most importantly, archetypal theology, which we see in God, which is God's knowledge of himself. Antonius Andreas rightly says in my mind that the first three conditions, that it's true knowledge, it's by necessary object, and that the object is evident and gives evidence to the intellect, these are perfections. These are good, these are, I, in a very, uh, or in an analogical sense, you could say they're pure perfections. They don't imply, um, imperfections in themselves. Um, but the last one is actually an imperfection, that it's caused by premises leading to a conclusion, because this is speaking, of course, of a created intellect, one that needs to be moved from potency to act. So this is one where the reason is, is operating discursively. So in God and in the blessed, perhaps, well, definitely in God, I, I would say in the blessed as well, um, theology is a science according to the first three conditions but God does not reason discursively. So the fourth uh, condition doesn't apply there. In, in living creatures or the, the wayfarers, theology is scientific according to the first, second, and fourth conditions. Uh, so leaving out um, that the object is evident or gives evidence to the intellect. So this is where things get tricky. Looking at these conditions, are we, we, I don't think we can say that theology is scientific in a completely unqualified way, but I do think that there is a, a strong sense in which theology is scientific. Does it meet all the conditions? I don't think so. 
certainly not in this life. But I do think it meets important conditions where it's more scientific than not. I, I, I am comfortable with saying that it is scientific, though in a slightly improper way, not, not so strictly defined. Ultimately, we would say certainly, I would say that God, it's scientific. God has perfect knowledge of himself. It's scientific. And he doesn't have the imperfection of the discursive reasoning, as we'll later see in the Summa. Um, but for wayfarers, it might not be. So now let's look at Aquinas' responses to the objections. Uh, and I'm also going to respond to Gerhard's objections, as best as I think would represent Aquinas. Um, and I generally agree with Aquinas on this subject. So Aquinas... Um, his, on the contrary, and I answer that the, the idea that, well, there are sciences that are given, um, that, that are, I guess you could say purely from reason and not on authority. Um, and then there are the sciences that are from authority. So ma making that distinction, that suffices to respond to, uh, objection one saying that theology is reducible to higher science. I think this is a sufficient response to one of Gerhard's objections as well. Now, it, again, it's well, what what definition is Gerhard working with, perhaps? Um, I, I don't want to just say, oh, Gerhard's completely mistaken. He doesn't know what a science is or something. I, I try not to attribute theologians just very basic mistakes like that. Perhaps he's working off some different definition that was more popular in the time of um, the post-Reformation era, because there were different strains of Aristotelianism and, and logic then, of course, with people, uh, the Lutheran Scharf, and then, of course, with people like Jacopo Zapparella. I'm not making an absolute claim that this is definitely what causes the difference, but I'm saying it's possible. Anyway, if Gerhard wants to define science differently than Aquinas, not allowing for science to be dependent upon another, then that's, again, it's like fine, I guess. Um, I think it's wrong, but it's like it makes more sense of what Gerhard is saying. But if we're just following Aquinas' definition, then really it's not, the objection doesn't pose any problem. I mean, God has scientific knowledge of, him, uh, scientific knowledge of himself, so commu communicating those truths to us is more scientific than not. I think Revere Franklin Widener actually has a really good comment on this. This is from his Prolegomena. The objection also has been made that theology cannot be regarded as a science because the truths that are therein contained are not proper objects of knowledge because they are to be apprehended only by faith. But faith and knowledge do not stand in such relation to each other, each other as to preclude the possibility of theological science. Faith is only a higher sort of knowledge. By faith, we apprehend what is beyond our knowledge. The three elements of faith are knowledge, assent, and confidence. The first two are acts of the intellect, and the third an act of the will. This intimate coherence of faith and knowledge is constantly and expressly referred to in the Bible itself. Anyway, I think that all suffices for the first objection. Aquinas responds to the second objection, the one about uh, individual facts being contained in theology, by saying that these individual facts are not properly the focus of theology as a science, but instead are examples for morals and, and work for other things in the faith. I think this is a fine response. Um, these aren't the proper objects of theology, but nonetheless are related to it. I think this is also the case, uh, especially for the, the Lutheran concept of theology, which is going to be more anthropological um, than Aquinas' concept of theology. We'll get to that in a later video. Overall, these individuals serve as examples and in some sense causes of the things, at least for Lutherans, that we'll focus on. So it's valuable to know them. Therefore, theology is not diminished as a science. Um, to be brief here, I will mention what the Lutheran view is. We're not going to speak, and again, this is going to be discussed later by Aquinas, but we are more so going to speak about the object of, of the theological sciences, the salvation of man and, and Christ and so on, where it actually is these things are going to pertain not only as moral examples, but in some sense causes. So like individual facts about the fall, for example, are actually going to fit into um, objects of faith in a way that I don't think it would as much for Aquinas. Not that it doesn't at all, but I think it's going to operate, um, it's going to be more proper to our definition. So in both, I think Aquinas' response is fine and good. Now let's look at Gerhard's objection. So um, his objection that understanding is the goal in theology, but understanding is the basis of science. It's a fairly interesting argument, uh, I suppose. So I would say that in science, we seek understanding in a real sense, but we begin with understanding in another sense. So we understand a few things and build our theology upon that. Think of the principles of grammar, logic, et cetera, that are required for understanding theological truths. This is precisely where we would distinguish theology as a subalternated science, perhaps. Um, recall that a subaltern or subalternated science is one that 
relies on philosophical principles known by a higher science. So there are sciences that depend on other sciences first in some way, where those sciences serve as subalternating sciences. Now, I do think that, sci that the science of theology is the highest in terms of its dignity and so on, and that especially in God, it's the highest. But perhaps for us, for the wayfarer, it's going to, in some sense, depend on things that um, on other sciences, like uh, the, the development of theological conclusions is partially going to come off of logical reasoning. I mean, just regardless of your, your view of sola scriptura, perhaps, unless you're like a, a, a really extreme biblicist, the way theology, in at least in scripture, works is not just purely a series of didactic statements. Um, there are times when people make theological conclusions that are somewhat like, I won't say out there, but are fairly um, that are implied in passages, but are not super explicit. An example that a friend of mine brought up, um, and actually a, an example that I believe it was Chemnitz brings up somewhere, um, is that, oh no, it was Preuss, sorry, um, summarizing Kalov, that when Christ proves the resurrection to the Sadducees, he doesn't just go, oh, here, here's a passage in the Old Testament. He doesn't well, go actually look at Job, who speaks of seeing his mediator. He doesn't look at some passage that would explicitly say the resurrection. He looks at the fact that God is the Abraham of, uh, sorry, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then this other thing that God is the God of the living, not the dead. And so he makes a conclusion on the basis of that. Well, that, that does operate on some principles of logic. So um, it seems that at least for the wayfare in the order of knowing at the very least, the sciences of logic and so on um, are going to build up the the use of the theological science. So I don't think Gerhard's response here is really adequate. And in the case of God, of course, um, we wouldn't make these really strong distinctions between the sciences, especially because God does not know discursively. God knows perfectly and immediately. Anyway, I think that um, Aquinas really responds to this objection fairly well in his response to the first objection. Um, and ultimately, Bonaventure is going to make a, a similar statement um, regarding like his commentary or in his commentary on the sentences where he says that the sentences are subalternated by scripture. So theology in some way is uh, subalternated by something else. Anyway, let's look finally at Gerhard's objection that something false can underlie science, but nothing false can underlie faith. I, I just have to be honest, I don't know where he gets this idea that something false can underlie science. It, it doesn't appear that something false can. I just, I'm just being honest. I don't know where Gerhard get this, gets this. He just says it. He doesn't say, well, according to Aristotle uh, or according to, to Zabarella or somebody like that. He just says it. And I'm, I've never seen anybody hold that view. So uh, if anybody has any thoughts on that, I tried to research it. I couldn't find anything as really supporting what he says here. So I think he may just be operating on a different definition. Uh, again, I don't like to attribute just being wrong to somebody, um, like being wrong at a very basic level, like just complete misunderstanding of somebody like Gerhard. Um, and I do the same, of course, with people I disagree with. I don't like to look at somebody like Aquinas where I disagree and say, oh, he just completely misunderstood this without backing it up um, or showing like why he would misunderstand it. So again, I don't know where he gets that. I just think it's a blatantly false thing to say. So finally, I thought I would say my own thoughts on this. Um, I've given my own in some respect, but like, what do I think of this article? Do I agree? All that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I, I think at the end of the day, the way we define science is going to affect things really significantly. It seems to me, from what I can tell, that Gerhard is defining science differently than Aquinas. And as such, I think that's where some of the disconnect is. I would stand with Aquinas, with Scotus, Hallatz, and others in saying that theology is scientific. Recall again that science is not the same between the modern definition and the ancient medieval definition. It's not something inductive that we perform to find results about in the natural world. It's a certain knowledge of things according to their causes. David Hallatz calls theology, quote, the science of God and divine things communicated to intelligent creatures by God. And I'm personally willing to speak of theology in this way. So with all this, you have to remember, we don't simply discard Aquinas and other thinkers. We're influenced by this classic theologians, though we may disagree with them at times. Things will differ when we get into the question regarding theology as practical or speculative, um, which is, a, I think, a few articles later. But nonetheless, we can agree that it is a science. Um, I think that while Gerhard disagrees, he's simply wrong. But him being wrong, and it's not really that big of a deal. Gerhard thinks that theology is best classified as wisdom and not a science. 
I think David Hawatz is actually correct on this instead. He says that wisdom is a species of science. So there's not a real distinction, but only a formal one, to use his own words uh, per my translation. That said, what's more relevant in the question of theology is either, well, is as to whether it's practical or speculative and as to the object of theology. I think that's much more relevant, um, though it is nonetheless, this question that we just examined is an interesting one. So let me know if you have any um, questions, any thoughts about this. And if anybody knows more about um, where Gerhard is getting some of these ideas as to the nature of science that seem to disagree just uh, explicitly with Aristotle Aquinas as to the definition, please let me know. Thanks all for watching. I hope this was helpful. Um, and I look forward to doing more of these. I'm hoping to pump out some more videos on this subject. I've been focusing on some other ones. But um, as, I, as I read through the Summa, I'm like writing this stuff. Um, and it's great to be filming it. So thanks for watching, everybody. Bye. Hey everyone, thanks for watching another Scholastic Lutherans video. If you'd like to support us, you can follow us on Twitter at Gerhard's Ghost, or contribute on Patreon at Scholastic Lutherans. There you'll get access to our Telegram chat and other perks. Links can be found in the description. Subscribe, like, or leave a comment, and have a nice day.